Welcome to the Think Bigger Mastermind, where Steve Yeager and Justin Stoddart interview the best and brightest minds in business and real estate. Their focus is helping realtors in Portland, Oregon solve the industry's biggest problems, enabling listeners to take their individual businesses to the next level. And don't forget to subscribe to get their most current episodes. Hey, welcome to the Think Bigger Mastermind with Steve Yeager and Justin Stoddart. We are so excited to have a guest today that is, I should say, world famous guest today, Jesse Garcia from the Roseville, California area. I have known Jesse for, man, it's got to be seven or eight years now, maybe even going on longer than that. Jesse is the co founder, the co owner of Maverick Real Estate Group in Roseville, California area. And he also is the CEO of Pipeline Wizard. So we're excited to have him today. Before we get started, and Justin and I have to do this every week, and we, we always forget, so we'll do it at the very beginning this time. All opinions expressed by Justin and I are ours and ours alone and have nothing to do with our employer, Old Republic Title. So now that we've ensured that we're not going to get fired this week and we can keep our jobs for at least a little bit longer, let's welcome in our guest, Jesse Garcia. How are you, Jesse? Doing well. Thanks, Steve. I love the intro. <laughs> I'll try not to blow it for you. <laughs> That's good, yeah. So since we've known it for so long, that's also a disclaimer to you that anything that has happened before I joined Old Republic two years ago is actually off limits to talk about. So anything that's happened on 6th Street in Austin or 4th Street in Austin, maybe even 5th Street in Austin, we keep between us. Uh, that wasn't in the contract, my friend, so sorry. You lived since middle school, so you just let me know, Jesse. I got more dirt than you probably. <laughs> awesome. We'll do lunch next time I'm in Oregon. <laughs> I love it. So, Jesse, thanks for joining us today. I know you're super busy. i tell you how busy Jesse is. He is coming from a listing appointment, and then as soon as we get done, he's got to run to another listing appointment. So I think it's pretty fair to say that real estate market's still somewhat hot down in the uh, Central Valley. Is that true? Yeah. It very, you know, real estate's always hot. Right now, inventory's low, as I'm sure you guys are feeling up there in Oregon. You have, what, about a month of inventory right now? Roughly. Yeah. And uh, what's amazing is I, I, along with other people with the same mindset, see just massive opportunity in that. And it's just, I think, what we'll brainstorm on this call about, too, is how to take advantage of that. Yep. That's awesome. Hey, Jesse, one of the things we like to do at the beginning with our guests is kind of get a feel of how you got involved with real estate. So can you tell me a little bit about, you don't have to start out from being on your finger painting scholarship in kindergarten, but maybe start out with, you know, right before real estate, what were you doing? Well, the finger painting scholarship was the highlight. Um, yeah. <laughs> prior, prior to that, uh, you know, it's funny as I worked in law enforcement here in the Sacramento area, and um, I read a book that a friend of mine gave me called "Rich Dad Poor Dad" by Robert Kiyosaki. And uh, sad to say, it's probably the third book in my entire life that I probably read cover to cover. Uh, I wasn't a fan of reading, and I still made it through high school and college. Imagine, I don't know how that worked out. Um, and got into law enforcement. So when I read the book, I said, great, I want to be a real estate investor. I want to learn as much as I can about real estate. So I enrolled myself in a local junior college here in Sacramento and took apparently all the right classes I needed to get my real estate, uh, to at least apply for the real estate exam. And my instructor says, well, why don't you go take the test? And I said, he goes, it's only 25 bucks. I said, I don't want to be a realtor. I want to invest in real estate and become a millionaire. And uh, at this time, it was uh, 2006, and uh, what you, you don't know what you don't know, and your ignorance is kind of bliss. So I said, fine. Went and took my real estate exam, passed it, and I said, great, now what? And he said, there's a great company, Keller Williams, that just came to town not too long ago, and go check them out. So I went in, talked to the team leader, and signed on that day, in November 2006. And my first deal <clears throat> was a referral from my mom and she said a friend of mine wants to buy in Reno I, said, I go I don't work there I can refer it out so I made a 15 minute phone call introduced the client my mom's friend to an agent in Reno and closed that about uh, 90 days later and I remember sitting at the main jail where I worked looking at a paycheck for 80 hours of work that I've been doing and then looking at a paycheck that I just picked up from Keller Williams for a 15 minute phone call and I remember thinking okay something's not right here um, and the light bulb went off and I said okay well I need to make some adjustments here and I said I can't do real estate if at a part-time level uh, I tried 
And so I actually demoted myself on purpose to go to a different location so I can have three days on, three days off, four days on, four days off, and focus on real estate on my days off to build up some momentum. And then in 2000, uh, July 1st, 2008, I walked into my boss, put in my 30-day notice, and quit my job. Um, nothing in reserve, nothing in the pipeline. Uh, as you know, Steve, my wife uh, supported me 100%. She's just like that, trusted and had faith in me that I'd provide. Um, and so I literally just I quit. August 1st, I left and started real estate with nothing, did an open house, got my first listing, started working with buyers, started closing like crazy, which was great. And my first year in real estate, I completely replaced my income that I was making while working at the sheriff's department. And uh, what was funny is after I watched that movie, um, uh, what was the movie that just came out uh, about the whole bank scandal <clears throat> during that time? The Big Short. The Big Short. The Big Short. So I was watching The Big Short, and they show at towards the end the date that the three major banks closed their doors during that time. And I said, wow, I quit my full-time job with benefits, retirement, a steady paycheck a month and a half before they closed their doors. <laughs> and the people that were so motivating to me and inspirational said, if you can make it in this market, you can make it in any market. And that's just been my mindset for the past eight, ten years in real estate. I got to tell you a quick uh, story, Jesse, that um, I attended my uh, one of my son's uh, preschool graduations this past week and uh, every kid, so the first couple of kids stood up and at the end they said what they want to be when they grow up and a couple of them said police officer which started this chain reaction of like all ten kids wanted to be a police officer. Now I'd never heard that my son wanted to be a police officer but apparently there was this this uh, peer pressure amongst the uh, preschoolers to be a police officer. There was nobody that wanted to be a realtor and definitely nobody that said they wanted to be a title guy. So it's nice to hear that um, you get down the road a little bit more and uh, life's actually better in the seats that we're sitting in than the one you were in. Well, it, what's great about that is <clears throat> I, I, my intention wasn't even to be in law enforcement. I didn't grow up going, I want to be in law enforcement. My dad was in law enforcement. My sister now is CHP in LA. I, I, I didn't grow up wanting to do it. My dad worked for the department. You know, I was 22, 23 years old. Um, still didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. You know, I'm, I'm not perfect like Steve Yeager and had my whole <laughs> life planned out. So I didn't know what I wanted to do. And my dad was like, okay, here's an application to the academy. Fill this out. You're going to go. And I'm like, okay. So I did it. And one of the things that I, I, I love it, and I still do miss it, and there, but the part about it that drove me nuts was – I could work next to somebody that has just been there longer, that's getting paid more than me, that I'm working harder than and doing more than, or they can call in sick and their workload transfer to me, and I'm stuck doing the work because they have tenure. And, or they were complaining, I hate my job. Well, then quit. Well, I don't want to. I got retirement and benefits. I got a steady paycheck. Then stop complaining. And in real estate, what I loved about it was if you don't work, I, I don't care. <laughs> If you don't work, it's actually better for me. So my mindset shifted, and that's why my career changed was because I knew I had full control over how much money I wanted to make, and whether you worked or not didn't affect me one bit. At my old job, when you didn't work, it pissed me off <laughs> because yeah. it created more work for me, and you were still making more money than me. There's actually a realtor here in the area who just transferred from law enforcement to uh, real estate that I'm reminded as you're speaking. And he, he said the biggest reason why he wanted to make the transition is because the conversations that he had amongst coworkers, well, like wasn't uplifting. Like it was, it was uh, just not a good environment. It wasn't one of personal growth. And now he's in an environment where they're constantly talking about growth and growing themselves. And he said it's just that alone, let alone the difference in, in you know some of the other benefits, but just the, the atmosphere itself, the mentality of people that attracts that certain industries attract is very different. Well, yeah. I mean, when when you know it, when uh, you know a mutual friend of mine and Steve, Patrick Woods. So when Patrick, Steve, and I get together, I would say about you know eighty nine eighty nine percent of the conversations are at a pretty high level. Um, the other eleven percent we won't mention, um, but the eighty nine percent of the conversations are, are very uh, very motivational. They're you know I, we definitely drive each other. And when you're in an environment where you're surrounded by people that push you, that go, great, I, I'm going to take your idea and one up it. First, you're like, okay, 
I had a great idea and you just one upped it. Okay, you're a jerk. Then five minutes later, you're like, okay, no, no, that's pretty genius. That's pretty cool. And as you go through that process, you just get into an environment where people love what they're doing. And when you're in an environment with people that love what they're doing, the conversations are at a completely different level. And one of my favorite sayings is if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. And uh, I've never been that person, so I'm always in the room with people smarter than me, um, like Steve and Patrick and other friends of ours. So it's, it's amazing to be in that environment where you push each other. And in this, in real estate and in any kind of sales position, you need to have that. Otherwise, you will just be stagnant, you'll be bored, and you're going to fail or, or quit because it just wasn't what you thought it was going to be. What, what you just described, I think, is what Steve Yeager's done with title and escrow. And again, having been uh, brought into this industry by Steve and because of Steve, the conversation is totally different that we have internally based on what we hear from other people that are uh, maybe our competitors, et cetera. And it's, um, it's really fun to be kind of reinventing the industry from this side, having those types of conversations. And I credit Steve for that. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very similar experience. And we just love what we do, and we, we really feel like we're disrupting the industry. So thanks for sharing that good stuff. <clears throat> Well, what's, what's funny about all that, on a, not on, too much on a tangent, what's funny about that is the conversations that I had when I, was a, when I worked in a different sector was either people beating their chest about what they've accomplished, what they've done, and what's funny is in our industry and the conversations that we have, we talk more about how we've just massively failed and where we completely screwed up and so we're learning from each other going, okay, don't do that, which is saving us time and money. So when you're in an environment with people that can share and be completely transparent of where they screwed up, where they messed up, where they failed, it helps the entire core group of people move forward because now we all have different experiences, we're all doing different things, we're all screwing up in our own way and we're sharing it and we just build off of that so we have a stronger foundation and then we celebrate later. Very cool. I like that. The rising tides raise all boats. You get surrounded with a group group of people, and I think the key to that, a good mastermind. I, I appreciate you saying the nice things, both guys. But Jesse, when you and Patrick and I get together, and some of our other friends like Matt Hson and some other, you know, just we, I, I would say Jesse, you and I are pretty blessed to being around a lot of very smart people. <laughs> some yes. people that are <laughs> more than happy to put it out there, and I think that what I've found, the smarter and the more talented the person most of the time they're more likely to share. They don't feel intimidated that what they have is this thing that they can't share with anybody else. They're more than happy. It's, it's their gift from God and they're going to share it with everyone. Yeah. And I think that I've gotten better from listening to those people who are willing to, to share things that you maybe wouldn't hear. And I think it's, we've been with companies that are like that, which is really nice. I also hear stories from people's companies that aren't like that, where it's, yeah. it's not this, it's this, you know, and I don't know, to kind of segue a little bit into Pipeline Wizard. So, you know, I, I, Pipeline's exciting. The first time, I, I, I didn't know if Pipeline was exciting at the beginning or just Jesse driving Pipeline was, was exciting. <laughs> well, it's cool. You are so passionate about Pipeline. Can you give us, a, a, just real quick, kind of how you got into Pipeline Wizard, having starting the company, where you saw the need for something like that, and kind of how that process has gone for you? Uh, oh, thanks. It's, it's been interesting, and my passion around it uh, definitely was there before the product was there. Um, and 1.0, looking back, now that we have 2.0, you know, we thought 1.0 was the greatest thing since sliced bread. 2.0, now we're like, oh my gosh, 1.0 sucked. 2.0 is way better. And um, Patrick told me, he read somewhere that they said, if you are proud and, and are 100% happy with your first release, you launch too late. And so what I love about technology is that it's an ever-changing, it, 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 it just, it morphs every single time we add to it. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, how Pipeline came about, when I started in real estate, it, it, it was twofold. One, I didn't know how to track commission or how my commission was calculated. I had no clue. And uh, I remember getting my first check going, okay, that's not 3% of 400000 I remember I talked to my team later about how splits work and caps and all that other fun stuff. I didn't understand it. And so I really wanted to build something where I can track my pipeline, what, who I was working with, what that meant in terms of money for me. And then my CPA told me, he goes, you're saving for your quarterlies and, and your, your taxes, right? And I said, I have no idea what a quarterly is and why do I need to save for taxes? It was taken out of my paycheck. I came from a W-2 employee status where I didn't know it, <laughs> there was only a 1099. Um, 
so I met with my CPA and he goes, you got a budget. So literally, every commission I had from GCI all the way down to net that I got to take home, uh, I tracked. I knew every penny, every dollar that was coming out of my check, where it was going, was I getting return on investment. The other thing, with my wife and I both being self-employed and me quitting my job, she wanted to know how much money was she can count on coming in so we can pay our bills. And so instead of me going, oh, well, I'm going off and meet with this person. I'm having coffee with this person. I'm going to have a drink with this person. I'm going to meet with this person. And it looks like all I'm doing is out having fun and, and going on meetings. I could just say, great, here's, here's, my, here's my login or here's my spreadsheet for you to log in. And it shows you black and black and white how much money we have the potential of making this week, next month, in the next three months. And this is who I have that I'm working with right now. So that's how it started, was I wanted a good idea of what my business looked like now and 30, 60, 90 days from now. And my wife liked it because she goes, great, are we going to have money to pay our bills this month because you just quit your job? And I need to know that you're working. So that's how it started. And then it just kept getting, it just, we just kept building onto it a year after year going, great, I want to know what my average sale price is. I want to know what my average list price is. I want to know how many units I'm, I'm closing. And then once I started diving into just understanding the numbers, what was funny is it, the, the light bulb went off going, wait, I can make more money simply by raising my average sale price, by simply raising my average list price, and I don't even have to do any more units if I don't want to, and I can still make more money. And it's just the power of knowing numbers. The numbers thing, what, what's, what's scary why most people don't do it is because it's the truth. You, you, you can't lie. You can't hide from them. And most people in this profession get into it because of the freedom. They get into it because they can just do whatever they want. They can just wing it. And until you start laying down the numbers and you start looking over that with your family, your coach, your, your, your rainmaker, your team leader, it, it's just all fun and games. You know, I remember when I was a team leader with Keller Williams and I used to have coaching calls. They, they were great coaching calls. But when Mike Fleming said, I want to look at your multi-year trends report, stuff got real. And it got real quick because uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't lie about it. I couldn't even BS it if I wanted to. It was these are the facts. These are the numbers. And you're on track or you're not on track. And how are you going to get back on track or how are you going to blow your goal out of the water if that's what you want to do? So Pipeline really morphed into an accountability system where I wanted to track my numbers. How many people do I need to talk to before I get a listing? How many listing appointments am I going on before I get them in a contract? How many contracts am I getting before I get one closed? So it just helped me predict my business. So we said, great, other people wanted it. So we built an application out of it and put it online, on the line. The World Wide Web. <laughs> Love it. So that was really the gist of it. Um, you know, and, and it, we keep building it. And what's what's funny, and I was having this conversation with Patrick and my and my co-founder Pernil, uh, with Pipeline. De uh, technology in real estate is not new. I personally feel the technology that Pipeline Wizard provides is probably two to three years before its time in the real estate market. And I say that because. When you think of technology in real estate, you think of, great, is this providing leads for me or is this a, C a CRM? Both of those systems, 95% of agents are paying for but they don't use correctly. Mm -hmm. And they're not tracking their numbers to begin with to know, do I have business coming in? Am I going to get paid? So I look at that and I, I look at, great, you look at all these great coaching companies out there in the industry that either have their own tracking system or they don't use one at all. And... I would say Pipeline is about two to three years ahead of its time where in two to three years it will be a business where you need to track your numbers just like Amazon, Apple, Nike, Old Republic. You guys know your numbers. If you didn't, you guys would be out of business. And I think it's educating the real estate industry on if you want to make money and you want to last in this, you don't want to work in real estate until you're 90, no offense to the people that do, you need to know your numbers and run your business like a business. Otherwise, you're going to be out of business very quickly. That's funny you say that, Jesse. We... Uh... You know, our, our mission really is to <clears throat> raise the, the thinking and the actions of real estate agents, help them live a better life, close more transactions, not just have a good experience once they get to the closing table, but actually have more 
closing table experiences and a better quality of life to go with it. And um, I love what you said. You know, we, we see tremendous pressure on realtors with the advent of technology, right? The, the red fins, the zillows of the world. It seems like agents are at times battling against that. And uh, it, you know, we teach them to embrace it. You know, to take the good and teach the, the, their their clients the, what's not good about it, but don't fight it. And it's fun to see a technology come in that actually helps agents treat their business like a business. Uh, like you said, it's different than a CRM. It's different than a, a lead generation tool. It's that it's that part that I would say if you could line up ten realtors, nine out of ten of them are not necessarily numbers people. Uh, they're they're fairly good lead generators for the most part. If you were to look at the average realtor, I would guess. But as far as numbers people, they don't get into sales because they're necessarily good with numbers. So to me, you're solving a really big problem that realtors have, and oftentimes kind of brush under the rug. And especially in a good market, they can get you know brush under the rug. But those that <clears throat> I think that will really survive the commoditization of service professions will be those that really take owning their business to a whole new level. And I think tools like Pipeline Wizard, um, which has been validated by In the News, right, as a, as a mm -hmm. uh, you know amazing technology, that people that really embrace those and treat their business with a whole new level of seriousness will really really thrive in the future months and years. Yeah. Well, and, and what's 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 interesting about that whole concept too, and I was when I was up. Uh, uh, teaching up in Oregon and Vancouver, I, Steve, uh, and Steve and Jen were, uh, provided enormous hospitality. Thank you again, Steve, for that. I was having a great conversation with Jen in regards to what she does at Nike, and it, it, it's numbers, it's 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 trends, it's monitoring behaviors and activities. And if you don't have that data, Nike doesn't know what to do or how to move forward with something. Same thing in real estate is if you're not watching your numbers or the trends or what's working or what's not, you can be throwing money or time in a direction that's not giving you any benefit whatsoever, but you're thinking it's working or because Steve's doing it and he's paying for it and it's working for him, I'm going to pay for it and just pray that it works. So I think a lot of agents do that as well as they say, oh, this is working for this person. Let me do that or let me spend money on that because it's working for them. And then they just drop five grand over a three-month period. They didn't get a return from it because they didn't work. And I think that our industry is utilizing technology as a leverage piece for themselves, not an enhancement to their business. And what I mean by that is they're, they're lazy. You know, they're, they're trying to make technology do their job for them and not work. And it, that's just not the case. It relate, real estate is still a relationship business, and technology helps enhance your business. It doesn't, it doesn't take over it. And so I think that's where a lot of agents in, in our industry need to get their heads wrapped around that and going, wow, I still need to work. I still need to talk to people. I still need to get out there and use systems to enhance my business, not to completely take over what my roles and responsibilities are in my business. So, I, you know, I, I think the great thing about numbers is tell a story, right? We keep talking about that. We, we, we've experienced the multi-year trends report, like you said, that there's no hiding from that. But I think, you know, the one thing that I real estate agents who are largely entrepreneurs at heart, right? They, they have, they've gone, done something. Most talented real estate agents didn't get into real estate because they didn't want to have a boss and they wanted to be have their own free time. They actually realized going on your own and not working for a company is probably a lot harder than actually working eight to five and getting an expected paycheck. They're doing something a little bit different. You better know your numbers with that. And I think if you, what you can take from corporate America, as you're saying, from the Googles, the Nikes, and the place, is numbers play a huge role there in three different ways. One, there's always an overall goal that companies are trying to hit, and it's dictated by a number. Whether you're publicly traded or private, you're tracking the number you're trying to hit over the year. And then what pe when people think about numbers, they think about the lag measures that that you're going, you know, you're, that you're tracking throughout the process. Where I think that being a nimble entrepreneur, you have the, the opportunity is to track not those just that lag, but the, the, the everyday activities, the things that you can do to move that needle on a daily basis. You have that ability to do that. Where you get into corporate America, it gets tougher. You get bigger. You become a big bar to turn. As an entrepreneur, even if you are a real estate agent doing 40 or $50 million a year, which is a solid, solid, good business, you have still have the ability to track those lead measures on a regular basis to go affect your lag and affect the overall goal. I think it's just the it's what can we learn from the bigger companies and then direct our sailboat, not our big barge, and how to, how to get there. And I think that's one of the things. It's ex been exciting watching you and Patrick start Maverick and to, and to do with Maverick is you guys have taken what you've learned 
from running real estate companies, what you've learned from Pipeline, and now you're bringing it back as you're launching a group, and you guys are having a ton of success early on. Would you agree? Yeah, we're, we're extremely blessed with, I mean, only really being in business for five months, and, and I mean, our own agents are, are destroying their goals that they set out to do within our own group in the first year. They're achieving it in the first three months, you know, which is great. And I attribute that because they're motivated. They're hungry. And, you know, do they like tracking their numbers? Probably not. Do I like looking at numbers? No. Uh, do I know that it's what has to happen? Yeah. You know, in, in business, you don't always get to do what you love. And, you know, as long as you're doing 80 to 90% of what you love on a day-to-day -day basis, you're, you're going to do it, and it's not going to feel like work. And then there's always wait, wait, that thing that feels like work. Say that one more time. You don't always get to do what you love in business? Is yeah, you don't, you don't always get to do what you love in business. I mean, 80 to 90% of the time, you're, you're, you're out there doing what you love, which makes it, uh, it makes it, you, you keep coming back. When I love what Steve Jobs said, I was watching this yesterday again, is he said, most people are going to quit when it gets tough because they're sane. It's the insane people that move forward because who's going to take that type of beating? Who's going to take that type of failure and keep coming back? The people that are insane, but they're the ones that change the world. And, or at least change their life. And so what I look at and I go, great, do I look at numbers? Do I like looking at numbers? Do I like tracking numbers? No. You know, and I look at it and go, great, have, if you ever try to lose weight and you never want to step on a scale or track your calories or track how much you work out, good luck with that. Let, let me know how that works out for you. Or if you want to get out of debt, don't ever look at your credit card payment. Don't ever look at your interest rate. Don't ever look at how much you need to save. Good luck with that. You know, no matter what you do, it's always a numbers game. You can't pay your bills with a smile unless you're Steve Yeager. And, you know, for the most part, it's a numbers game no matter what you're doing. And I, I heard Patrick say this the other day. He goes, if you were watching a sporting event and there was no scoreboard, would you keep watching? Would it be interesting to you? No. So the same thing in business. If you have no scoreboard and you have no idea what you're doing or how you're keeping score or how you're going to provide for your family or how you're – you know, how you can go to your wife, your spouse, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your husband, whoever, and say, this is what our pipeline looks like, and guess what? We have enough to save for a vacation to go to Europe for, for two weeks or three weeks. You know, it's having the goal. And that's another thing that most people don't do in our industry. They don't set a goal big enough, you know, think bigger. They don't think big enough to go, great, I just need to sell two homes a month to pay my bills. That's great. What would happen if you sold five homes a month? What would you do with that money? What would you what would you save? What would you spend on? Would you be able to take put your kids in college? Would you be able to take that dream vacation? Would you be able to do some bucket list things? What does that look like? Most people's mindset is how many deals do I have to do per month to pay my bills? I love what you're doing with um, technology. You know, I think sometimes people have this fear of technology almost taking the place of a realtor. I think what it will do is it will remove the bad one. Right? Offline we had this conversation about bad realtors that are coming in without any training the people that come in for one deal and they don't know what they're doing, it's to grab a, a quick check. And I see that almost as like what Uber's done to the taxi industry. It hasn't gotten rid of the taxi industry, it's just raised the bar. It's gotten rid of bad taxi companies that had stinky cars and, and poor service, you know, people that were unfriendly, etc. And I think what will happen as technologies like Pipeline Wizard come in, they'll give agents more information so they have more knowledge and can act more intelligently, and they'll start to weed out the bad ones and people will start to realize you know, I don't need to work with a bad agent because this one's so far superior that, you know, like the ones that are really embrace the technology. Well, what's interesting to that, Justin, is um, what, what defines success in our industry? And I think that's a question that has always been out there, but nobody really likes to talk about it because you could talk to people doing 30, 40, 50, 100 million dollars in production, yet they're broke or they're not profitable. And so it's what is what does success mean? Is it units? Is it volume? Is it production? Or is it the amount of money you keep and that you can reinvest? Is it the amount of money you keep and you can do something else with it? Is it the amount of money you keep and you can provide for your family at a different level? And so, you know, with, with our mission, with Patrick and our mission with Maverick is production, volume, units, the, the, the accolades, the attention that we that we potentially down the road get because of our production, we honestly we don't care about that. It's how much money are we profiting? How much money is, are our agents profiting? Are we teaching them how to run a business? Are we teaching them how to run a profitable business? Are we teaching them how to create wealth with that profit and not just spend it on stupid stuff? 
And so that's really our mission is not to go, great, we want to do $100 million in production because we want to do $100 million in production. It's we want to do this, and this is where we want to be profitable, and we reverse engineer through that, and we use pipeline to track our production, our team's production, each member's production, and coach them along the process of, great, you're, you're having a very profitable month. Make sure you save for this. Make sure you allocate money for that. And so it's not just production and getting commission checks. It's adding value to team members on what to do with that money once you get it and make sure you're spending your money and time in the right places. I love it. Do you remember Gary Keller when we first joined Keller Williams? Do you remember what he used to always say? I mean, it kind of struck me with you guys said. His goal wasn't to grow a big real estate company. It, wasn't, it was to create 10,000 millionaires. Do you remember that? Mm-hmm. It was to create 10,000 millionaires. That was his goal. And so in order to be able to create 10,000 millionaires, it was he needed to grow this company. He needed to provide these services. He needed to, so that was his focus. That wasn't about just being big for big sake. It mm -hmm. was then helping grow those people within. I thought that's pretty fascinating. And what it's you guys are doing that. Well, it's very fascinating. What's, what's interesting about that, Steve, is that it's a numbers game. In order to create 10,000 millionaires, the 10% rule. He needed a yep. hundred thousand plus company, a hundred thousand plus agent company, and they're at one hundred forty thousand agents now, which is making that ten thousand millionaire a little bit more. It's more attainable because it's a numbers game. Not everybody in the company is going to be a millionaire. Yep. Very good. So I love that. It's good. Hey Jesse, as we wrap up here, you know, I, 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 we, we could do part two, three, three four, and five. I'd like that because you are a, you're a visionary and you are just a sharp guy. But you know, as we're moving forward, what are you? What's one or two things you think our listeners could do to really take advantage? Because one of the things I like is we that for having you on here is you guys' market has started to shift a little bit. Our task, we usually lag, oh, I would say somewhere between six months and a year and a half behind where you're at. And we don't have the extremes. We didn't have the extreme REO short sale market that you guys had. I mean, Roseville was one of the hardest hit areas of the country, mm -hmm. but. So we haven't had these highs and lows, but it's something I remember about a year, eh, probably about two years ago, you telling me about a, a open house one of your agents had that had like 125 people in line, and you know I was thinking that will never happen here. And then in my own home, I had 101 people waiting to get into my open house. So yeah. it is, we, we are now seeing that as we're starting to shift. How would you tell our listeners? How would you help our listeners take advantage of that market? <clears throat> right now, so. A shift is definitely coming. One thing that I would say that, that I've heard Gary Keller and Kristen Cole talk a lot about is a shift is coming. Make sure you are saving your money. Period. Like I don't care if you're killing it, if you're making tons of money now. Make sure that, that if the market does shift at a very dramatic level, make sure you have reserves. Make sure you have money um, and spend it wisely. The other thing too is that lead generation is going to solve any problem in any market you're in, hands down. Um, you need to be talking to 10 times more people and one of the things I love about um, the 10x rule by Grant Cardone is it, 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 what, no matter what your goal is, 10 exit. If you think you need to talk to 10 people to, to get a deal, talk to 100 people because the results will be there. And in a shifting market as in any market, you need to spend more time focusing on how many people do I need to talk to. It's a numbers game. The more people you talk to, the more business you'll get. And in a shifting market with low inventory, there is opportunity out there for listings. Listings are going to drive leads. And it's le better leverage for you as a real estate professional, right? It's all in the MREA book. Um, so, I mean, the answer to that question, Steve, it's, it's very simple. It's very basic. It's go back to the basics. It's lead generate at a very, very high level. Uh, it's not rocket science. You know, running a business... You know, what, what Patrick and I talk about with our entire team, I said, if you wake up motivated and you're learning based and you're not afraid to talk to people, we can teach you everything else about re running a real estate business. You know, we can't motivate you. We can inspire you. You better be motivated. You better be hungry. You better be learning based. And you better be willing to talk to people. Everything else, you can learn. And so with that, we literally have an agent, one of our top producing agents on our team, 22 years old, and is on Mojo with Boomtown, calling like crazy every morning, and she started off part-time. Her goal was to quit her day job by the end of this year. She quit after two months on Maverick, and she's already exceeded her annual income goal in the first five months. 
That's incredible. That is it's so just, awesome. I love doing hearing that. Basics. It's doing the basics. So don't and, and, not, and not being able to, and not being afraid to fail. So so in a market where people are frenzied and they might not be lead generating because there's so much business right now and they're dealing with multiple offers. You're saying carve out time to lead generate because what you're doing now is going to set up for the winter. Well, yeah, your lead generation activities today are going to be your commission check in 90 days. So, you know, if you, I mean, J June, July, August, whatever you have in the pipeline, that's what you have in the pipeline. Anybody that you're calling and talking to today is your August, September, October business. And mm -hmm. so if you want to have a great Christmas, if you want to have a great end of the year, and when that market does shift, we're in an election year. And so when that election, you know, that election happens, a new president is appointed and, I mean, or elected, you better have your ducks in a row because who knows what's going to happen. You look at trends, you look at market trends after an election year, interest rates are low, inventory is low. You know, the Fed raised their federal fund rate a quarter percent for the first time in, what, nine, ten years? I mean, anything can happen. I, I don't have my crystal ball. It's in the shop today. But for the most part, it's lead generate. That's the only thing you have control over is lead generating, talking to more people. Everything else is out of your control. That's the one thing you have control over. And if you give up control on that, you might as well just kiss your business goodbye. That's awesome. Well, Jesse, thank you so much. Justin, do you have any final thoughts? No, I just really appreciate your comment. It's uh, fun to learn from someone like you and, and appreciate the, the wisdom you've shared with uh, us as well as you know those that will see it here in the Portland market. Do it again. No, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. It's been an honor. That's awesome. All right. Well, hey, thanks everyone for listening. And uh, again, Jesse, thank you again. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you, guys.